A standoff that's frozen politics in Northern Ireland for two years is over. Pro-British unionists are to take their seats in the regional parliament, where the biggest party is Sinn Féin. But its goal is Irish unity. So could that happen, or will the UK remain intact? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Suspended by a boycott, Northern Ireland's power-sharing parliament, the Stormont Assembly, is to resume business. It marks the end of a two-year impasse that threatened political stability after a hard-won peace. The region in the UK was formed when Ireland was partitioned by Britain in 1921 and for decades was controlled by pro-British unionists. That's all changed since the last elections. The largest party is now Sinn Féin, formerly the political wing of the IRA that fought a violent conflict from 1969, seeking Irish unity. Tens of thousands of civilians were killed or injured in violence involving the British Army, police and several paramilitary groups. An international peace process over years brought a political settlement and the IRA disarmed in 2005. So, how important is the resumption of politics in Northern Ireland? Will the region remain in the UK? Or could Irish unity become a reality? We'll be discussing this and more in a few moments with our guests. But first, this report on how these events developed by Imogen Kimber. A two-year political stalemate ends in Northern Ireland. The Democratic Unionist Party, or DUP, dropping its boycott of the Northern Ireland Assembly. It had pulled out over new trading rules following the UK's withdrawal from the European Union under Brexit that it said undermine Northern Ireland's position in the United Kingdom. This package, I believe, safeguards Northern Ireland's place in the Union and will restore our place within the UK internal market. It will remove checks for goods moving within the UK and remaining in Northern Ireland. The power-sharing institution is central to the 1998 Good Friday Agreement that ended three decades of violence in Northern Ireland from the 1970s. Viewed as one of the most prolonged conflicts in post-war Western Europe at the time. The suspension of the assembly in Stormont near Belfast affected public services, creating severe difficulties, particularly in health and education. We're conscious that there is a, a huge amount of work to be done. Um, that uh, society has really suffered from the absence of uh, government over the last uh, two years. Uh, we're almost two years away from the, the last Assembly election. The Assembly can now sit for the first time since elections two years ago. The highest number of seats were won by Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA that fought British rule for 30 years. The first time a party seeking a united Ireland had won an election in Northern Ireland. Under the Good Friday Agreement, signed by all parties, the Irish and British governments, and underwritten by the US and EU, a referendum can be held on Irish unity. But only the British government can call one. The restoration of the Northern Ireland Assembly is triggering debate on whether that can now happen. For Sinn Féin, Irish unity is its number one goal. And for pro-British unionists, preventing that happening is theirs. Imogen Kimber, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. They're all joining us from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Danny Morrison, an author who formerly served as the National Director of Publicity for Sinn Féin in the 1980s, is with us. As is Mark Devonport, an independent journalist, author and former Northern Ireland political editor and Ireland correspondent. And Deirdre Heenan, Professor of Social Policy at Ulster University and a former member of the Irish Council of State. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, Danny, let's start with you. Sinn Féin's leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, uh, this week said that uh, Irish unity was now within touching distance. Has nationalism's day finally come? Well, certainly that is the direction of travel. There's no doubt about that. If you look at the uh, arc of the voting pattern in the last 20 years, most councils uh, in the west of this state are controlled by Sinn Féin. 
Sinn Féin is the largest political party in Belfast City Hall. And two years ago, Michelle O'Neill, who presumably tomorrow could become the First Minister, two years ago, Sinn Féin won the majority of seats, which entitles them to that position. And it was during that, that election campaign, incidentally, that the leaders of the two main unionist parties refused to state prior to the election that they would accept the result of the election, that they would uh, recognise Michelle O'Neill's right to be First Minister. And that's the reason why there's been so much suspicion from nationalists and Republican supporters uh, about the stance of the DUP in regards to the protocol and uh, the Windsor Framework document. There was a deep suspicion now that a uh, secondary and maybe the real reason behind their refusal to take their seats in Stormont uh, was for this reason, that they did not want to sit as a deputy first minister under a Sinn Féin Republican woman first minister. Mark, given that uh, Sinn Féin's breakthrough at Stormont undoubtedly has uh, both a symbolic and psychological significance, is that going to translate into Irish unity anytime soon? I mean, how can you have Sinn Féin as the most popular party in Northern Ireland with no, with no prospect of, of unification uh, in the near term? Well, as Danny Morrison says, it may point to a direction of travel, but I still think that that journey has got some way to go. The situation in Northern Ireland is that we've got essentially two big minorities here. There's a, a big minority uh, of uh, pro-British uh, unionists who want to remain part of the United Kingdom and a big minority of pro-Irish nationalists who want to join uh, with the Irish Republic of the South into one United Ireland. But the balance of power, if there's ever a border poll or a referendum on this question called in the near future, will be held by those who tend to see themselves as non-aligned who at the moment want Northern Ireland to work and want the bread and butter politics uh, to, to um, uh, be as comfortable and as prosperous for everyone as possible. And, and that's uh, signified by parties like the Alliance Party, the clues in the name, they see themselves as an alliance between different parts of the community here. And those people will have to be convinced, I think, uh, not just of the sort of uh, romantic notion of nationalism, but that it will also uh, be in their best interests and in their children's best interests in terms of economic and social realities. Deirdre, picking up on, on what Mark was saying there, tell us something about the demographics uh, of Northern Ireland and, and whether they're changing right now. The demographics of Northern Ireland are changing. And the last census, for the first time, we had a majority of the population who describe themselves as Catholics or born into the Catholic religion. So that is a huge change and something that has caused a lot of discussion. But it is important to say that when you're talking about Northern Ireland, we're not just talking about two large blocks of people anymore. It's not unionists versus nationalists. Thinking about Northern Ireland, we now think about it in terms of three minorities. So there are unionists, nationalists, and those people in the middle who are the non-aligned. They haven't decided either way where their vote would be in the event of a border poll. So while Danny Morrison quite rightly points to the rise of Sinn Féin, what it is important to say is that rise of Sinn Féin hasn't coincided with a, a fervour, a wave of support for Irish unification. That simply hasn't happened because the polls would suggest that that is still sitting at around 35%. And so there is a job of work to be done by both groups here, by unionists and nationalists, to convince those unaligned people where their future would be better. The issue around the collapse of Stormont was, I think eventually unionists realised that by staying out of devolved government and refusing to participate in power sharing, they were actually sending out a message that Northern Ireland was dysfunctional and couldn't operate as part of the United Kingdom. And therefore, they were actually harming the future of the union that they professed to love. So they walked away from that position and are now talking first and foremost about making Northern Ireland work, making it an attractive place to live and work in and plan your future. Danny, um, the Stormont Assembly then resumes business on, on Saturday. Tell us something about uh, Michelle O'Neill, the new First Minister. What, what's, her, what's her background? Uh, and to what extent could, could her assent actually cement Northern Ireland's position in the UK uh, simply by restoring confidence in the status quo? Well, firstly, Michelle O'Neill, I think, is in her 40s. Her father was an IRA prisoner 
And uh, we, after the 1981 hunger strike, and using the example of Bobby Sands, who died on the hunger strike, but before that was elected as an MP for Fermanagh South Tyrone, we adopted an electoral strategy. Uh, and the IRA was also fighting its armed struggle in parallel with that. So Michelle O'Neill's father, who was an ex-IRA prisoner, when he came out, he stood for election. He was elected to the local council in the Dungannon, Coal Island area. And when he died, uh, Michelle stood uh, in a by-election and she, she was successfully elected. And later she became an assistant to the late Martin McGuinness, who was deputy first minister in the assembly. Uh, she was, I think she was also the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Health as well. So her, her, uh, she has really risen up through the ranks. She's extremely articulate, very, very able, university uh, graduate. Uh, unlike myself, who the only university I went to was prison in Long Kesh. But she represents a new generation of very confident nationalists and republicans. To answer the the second part of your question. Uh, this theory that if Sinn Féin goes into the Assembly and makes it work, surely that is only going to cement the union with Britain. And I want to also sort of respond uh, to something that, that Mark and Dirty said. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, there will be no United Ireland unless we can make the social, economic and political case for it. Uh, this artificial state in the north, the six counties, uh, officially called Northern Ireland. It has always, uh, throughout its, the 50-year history that Union has controlled it, made second-class citizens of my community. Uh, to give you an example, when I grew up, I'm doing this interview from West Belfast. When I grew up, the Orange Order, the, you know, was celebrated uh, the ancient vic victory of Protestants over Catholics. The Orange Order was was able to march on the Falls Road at a time when we weren't able even to march into the city centre to uh, celebrate the National Saint, St. Patrick. All that has changed, Ch remarkable changes. I no longer feel vanquished. My community no longer feels vanquished. We are very, very confident. So therefore, uh, the going into Stormont is part of a process of reconciliation with uh, unionists, having conversations with them, working with them, and showing them that they have nothing to fear uh, from the nationalist Republican community. And along the way, of course, Sinn Féin, yes, Sinn Féin uh, openly, and for uh, uh, the whole period of its existence, has been, been campaigning for Irish independence. We do not accept uh, right now, we never accepted it yesterday, we will not accept it tomorrow, that the British government has any right to be here and to rule our lives. Uh, so that's as an objective, that's always been my aspiration. Meantime, we have to accept certain realities, and the reality is that we there, there is the union with Britain, and that you, that union was really undermined incredibly foolishly uh, by the DUP, who refused to compromise in the various compromises, for example, that Prime Minister Theresa May proposed as a compromise with the European Union, and they went for the hardest of hardest of Brexits. And that, the reason why, we believe, was because they wanted to see a border go back up between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland. And that border, which once was a highly militarised border, I mean, of the three to 400 roads, uh, about 300, 350 of them were blown up by the British Army, bridges were destroyed, and all traffic between the north and the south was funnelled through about 12 major checkpoints. And we believe that the, the DUP strategy and going for the hardest okay. of Brexits right. was to force a border back up again. Yeah, uh, Mark, um, picking up on, on, on what Danny was, was saying there about Brexit uh, in particular, I mean, forgetting your political allegiances, uh, do people in Northern Ireland want to be part of uh, the EU? What, what would be the benefits uh, to them? And um, is unification more or less inevitable, even if the people in Northern Ireland don't, don't particularly want it right now? Is it something that's going to happen eventually anyway? Uh, when we had the referendum on Brexit, a majority of people in Northern Ireland actually voted to stay within the European Union, and that was probably because uh, they were much more mindful to the sort of practical difficulties that we've experienced over the last few years and uh, that people were in England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, so uh, this whole business of trying to iron out those difficulties has been in the context of trying to 
uh, I suppose, recreate some of the balance, which was pretty much easier to create when both Ireland and the UK were both fellow members of the European Union and there weren't any of these particular barriers to trade uh, that we've been experiencing more recently. Um, is it inevitable? I'm not sure that a United Ireland is necessarily inevitable. I did a documentary uh, about three years ago, uh, which marked the 100th anniversary of the creation of Northern Ireland. And we did an opinion poll as part of that program. And most people felt that Northern Ireland would still be in the UK uh, by 2031. Uh, but a majority of people felt it might well have left and joined the United Ireland by 2046. Those dates were just on the basis of 10 years on from the 100th birthday or 25 years on from the 100th birthday. That was just, I suppose, people's guesstimate. Uh, but it's quite possible that we could um, go along the, that line. But there is a bit of a conundrum, which is that uh, the more stable and successful Northern Ireland is, then that might well mean uh, that people just feel that pushing uh, the extra uh, step along the road towards the United Ireland isn't worth all the bother. Deirdre, I mean, feel free to pick up on, on what Mark and, and Danny were saying there. Uh, but what about people in the Republic? Do they want unification? Could, could the, does the, can the, pub, the Republic afford unification? And, and would it lead to more instability if it happened? Well, I think picking up on what Mark and Danny have said, I don't know if United Ireland is inevitable, but what I do know is change is inevitable, that we will not stay static in this position and that we are changing. The biggest change, of course, was um, the Good Friday Agreement, where the constitutional arrangements um, for Northern Ireland were largely settled. We would stay as part of the United Kingdom until the majority of people wanted otherwise. Really, it was Brexit that came along and threw that constitutional arrangement up in the air. And we didn't know where the pieces would fall. There were many, many warnings from people living in Northern Ireland that Brexit would be a bad idea. Uh, but they were ignored. The then Secretary of State, Theresa Villers, talked about scaremongering. The DUP said this was nonsense, that it wouldn't have any impact on uh, Ireland. But of course, we knew that we were the only country in the UK that shared a land border with the EU. So Brexit has really unsettled people here. And they were settled prior to that. And the other thing we've learned since Brexit is the idea of voting for change without knowing what that change would actually mean is now an anathema to people. If we've learned anything through those toxic years of Brexit negotiations is that you don't take a leap of faith. People want to know quite rightly about what it would mean for their health service, what it would mean for education, what it would mean for the economy and their children. And those questions have yet to be answered. So I think regardless of what uh, people say, there is a huge amount of work to be done to say, this is what it would look like. We can address the questions that you inevitably have. And for people in the Republic of Ireland, there isn't a huge clamour for reunification. Again, they want to know, well, what would it mean? How much would it cost us? Um, what would the implications be? Because when we talk about borders, and we've talked about borders incessantly for the last seven years, it is important to say that borders uh, and the, the agreements that we're talking about at the moment, the trade deals are largely about trade and commerce and things that aren't really the business of day-to-day -day lives, whether or not things are checked at ports, what customs paperwork will look like. But borders are also about identity. They're also about emotional issues, where you feel attached to. Those are important considerations. And then also political borders, constitutional issues. So there are a whole raft of issues when we talk about taking away borders, easing borders or creating new borders. What we do know from Brexit is if there is to be change, people will want evidence. They will want to see what exactly does this mean for me? Um, what we your previous question about whether or not we wanted to leave the European Union, I can say as an academic that leaving the European Union has been disastrous. We warned it would be disastrous and indeed it is. It means that our young people, our students cannot travel freely across the European Union under the Erasmus scheme, go and widen their horizons and realise that there's more to the world than Northern Ireland. That has been taken from us. We as researchers cannot have the same access to um, EU-wide funds, EU-wide research schemes looking at innovation and health, for example, which is my research area. 
we could no longer be key parts of those research projects. They have been replaced by the British government, by, but by much inferior programmes. And so there has been a significant loss to us in terms of leaving the European Union that we can tangibly feel. Danny, I mean, feel free to pick up on that. But I also want to ask you, for, for, for such a relatively small place, Northern Ireland still uh, makes a, a lot of news headlines around the world. Why is that? Um, uh, are people there getting over their differences now? Um, or, or are the tensions still bubbling away under the surface? Well, I mean, uh, we've, the, the longest uh, armed struggle in Western Europe, uh, probably 50 years, was fought by the IRA and it led to negotiations. The British government, you know, had demonised Republicans and the Republican struggle has been criminal and eventually they were forced to negotiate with the Republican leadership and, of course, all of our prisoners were released from prison in a, in a general amnesty after the Good Friday Agreement. I think also perhaps a lot of interest from conflict regions around the world is because we borrowed from the peace process in South Africa. Uh, the likes of Martin McGuinness also was involved in, 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 in Colombia and in, in the Basque country. And Jerry Adams had visited the Middle East as well and spoken to Palestinian representatives. So perhaps people think that uh, there is a, a pathway using as a template. That's a perfect template, obviously, because we haven't a United Ireland yet. But uh, we have a process for getting there. And I think that's why there's still a great degree of interest in Ireland. Just want to pick up on something that Dirty did say there. The fact of the matter is that Almost all opinion polls in the south of Ireland and the Republic of Ireland have shown a vast majority in favour of Irish reunification. That, I, I, and in fact, the, one of the, the dilemmas is that when asked, are you prepared to compromise on a new national anthem or perhaps on a new national flag as a gesture towards the unionists to try and make them be, be more comfortable. A lot of people have said no. They, they, they have resented that aspect of it, mm. which, which would indicate a degree of nationalism and strong uh, Republican sentiment in the, in the south of Ireland. Uh, that is why Sinn Féin is critical of the Irish government. It, it has not invested the type of resources that Dirty has, has mentioned are needed. Okay. To produce right. papers, to produce the papers that we need to demonstrate yeah. that a United Ireland makes social, economic okay. and political sense. So, sorry to interrupt you, Danny, but time is against us. Mark, uh, what does the resumption of the Stormont Assembly actually mean for the people of Northern Ireland? How has the suspension uh, impacted upon people's lives, if at all? I mean, how significant is this? Well, we have seen a deterioration of public services here in Northern Ireland. Um, we have some of the longest waiting lists for hospital operations anywhere in the UK. Uh, we have crumbling infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, public sector workers who've been taking industrial action going on strike recently because they haven't been getting the kind of a pay settlements in line with inflation that their counterparts have been getting elsewhere in the UK or elsewhere in Ireland. So a financial um, uh, incentive from London of something like £3.3 .3 billion pounds will go a long way towards easing some of those difficulties. Um, whether this new government will deliver, I think, will be down to some extent to the will of the politicians who will be uh, sharing power alongside Michelle O'Neill, and also uh, to whether they can make what is still a rather unwieldy system work. The system that was designed under the Good Friday Agreement was designed in order to make sure that all the parts of the community here bought into a new dispensation uh, but quite often it's been a bit of a recipe for log jams and stalemate up at Stormont uh, where the power sharing executive sits. Uh, so I think it's still going to be a quick case of the jury being out on how well uh, the Northern Ireland power sharing government does over the next few years. I, I wanted to put that point to, to Deidre. How, uh, is the devolved system as set out in, in the Good Friday Agreement the best way to govern Northern Ireland today? It's complicated. But is it efficient? Does it work? Perhaps you can it is tell us. Yeah, tell us something about the storm at assembly itself, how it works, and how much power it has. Well, I suppose the best way to describe it is we have a mandatory coalition that ensures that majoritarianism, majoritarianism can't happen, so that uh, 
The two largest parties are in power are going to be Sinn Féin and the DUP. And that's because we are moving away from the idea that one group can dominate another group. But that is incredibly complex and complicated. And there is a groundswell of opinion now that we must reform the system because actually we invariably find ourselves in gridlock uh, where we cannot reach agreement on serious public sector issues. And the, there is a weary resignation in Northern Ireland that we seem to be faced with a choice between no government or bad government. So I can assure you, while people are cautiously optimistic that government is coming back, there are no parties. You won't hear any champagne cup uh, bottles being opened because People really don't want more of the same. If we were looking at the report card from our devolved administrations for the last 25 years, it would be could do much better. Um, we haven't moved forward in the key social policy areas of education, of health. Um, and I suppose we always have to be hopeful that if the parties actually truly want to share power, if the will is there, then they can find the way to do it. So there's a sort of debate going on is, do you blame the system? Do you blame the architecture that the Good Friday Agreement bought, brought? Or is it actually that it is the individuals who do not actually want to share power and resent the position that they find themselves in? Just going back to a point that was made earlier. But very tomorrow quickly, is very quickly. Tomorrow is an historic day because if you look back at the the state and the creation of this state, it was it was built for an inbuilt Protestant unionist majority, and there is nothing more tangible than the change that has happened mm. than Michelle O'Neill, a nationalist and Irish Republican, now set to take the top spot in the Stormont okay. government. As was a seat of power for Protestants. Okay, Mark, I've got a little over thirty seconds left. What will be the executives? main priorities when it when it returns to work? I think it'll be ensuring that its public services are improved. And firstly, that will be by uh, paying the public sector workers the money uh, that they're entitled to. That's going to be the first job. And then we might have some complications in relation to how this post-Brexit deal works out. We may have some challenges, uh, but there's plenty really uh, that's, uh, that's going to be in the in-tray of the politicians just sorting out, if you like, the bread and butter matters, bread and butter difficulties that we face. OK, there we must end it. Many thanks indeed to you all, Danny Morrison, Mark Devonport and uh, Deidre Heenan. And as always, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. Uh, for further discussion on this issue, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on X, our handle there at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, we'll see you again. Bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.